you record. Good. So we had uh, discussed this yesterday too. So this is reading two. The terms converging and diverging are often applied to spherical mirrors. Which term describes each of the two types? So which one is a converging mirror and which one is a diverging mirror? This is a part where we get audience participation. Um, converging, converging mirrors are concave mirrors because the rays come together, and then diverging mirrors are the convex mirrors because they go apart. Right. So, diverging are the convex, just as Isabel said, because mirrors, rays hitting those would go in different directions. Ooh, what is spherical aberration? And what causes it? It's kind of like this blurred image that you get um, mm -hmm. because a spherical mirror doesn't um, bring all the rays like parallel to the um, optical axis. And so like they don't all convert at a single point. So it's a little blurry. And, and a good point there is that um, it's not so much that it is, we can't get a perfect spherical shape. We can get really, really close to that. It's that spherical mirrors themselves don't actually do this perfectly, especially around the edges. And I see my next question has already led us into that. Um, the shape that does that, of course, is a parabola. And so you've probably come across that in math, that uh, the focus in a parabola is where everything would reflect into. Spherical mirrors are a really good approximation to a parabola, especially when you're near the center of the spherical mirror. But the farther you get out from the center, the less like a parabola they are. So you're actually seeing shapes you know, close to the optical axis, they would reflect and point here at a focal point, but the farther you get out, it might actually start focusing a little farther away, possible to be closer as well. And so your image formation actually blurs depending on where, what part of the mirror is collecting that light. And Next, then, if parabolic mirrors would reduce or even eliminate the spherical aberration, why don't we just use them instead of spherical mirrors? They're too expensive to make. Yeah. Spherical things are, are way, way easier to make than parabolic things. That shape is just really, really tough. For very, very expensive mirrors, like on our best telescopes, we go parabolic. Um, or the other alternative is to only use the center part of a spherical mirror and not the edge part. But then that means that we're making quite a bit of a mirror that doesn't really help. So depending on the shape, um, we can go spherical, but parabolic are best. Um, how can we describe the location of the focal point first for a convex lens or a mirror? Sorry. Where is the focal point for a convex mirror? Hit it, Kate. You unmuted. Um, it's like half of the radius curvature and it's in like the virtual dimension. So where is that virtual dimension? Like it's like behind the mirror kind yeah. of, but like. <laughs> right. 
it's one half the radius of curvature, which means the sphere that the the center of the sphere that this mirror is taken out of, and it's behind the mirror. What about concave then? It's the same thing just in front of the mirror. Right. Okay, three light, light, rays of light originating from an object are often used to graphically determine the location of an image formed by a concave mirror to, to describe how this is accomplished. I don't want to go through that in great de detail because we did that in class over the last couple of days. We've got a parallel ray uh, parallel to the optical axis that reflects back through the focal point. One that uh, passes through the focal point would be reflected parallel to the optical axis and one striking the uh, mirror on the optical axis will reflect at a downward angle the same as the incident angle and where those three intersect is where the image will be formed. So since we, we did that in such great detail, I'm gonna skip over doing that this part. N, does a concave mirror always form a real image? Uh, this one I said no, because if the object is between the focal point and the mirror, the image will end up being virtual instead of real. Yeah. And uh, not only that, it's also magnified then too. So that is still useful. Does a convex mirror always form a real image? You're shaking your head no, Tessa, why not? Um, because a, a convex mirror always forms a virtual image. Right, in fact, it never forms a real image. Because the light rays diverge from its surface, they can't be focused in the real world. Um, how are the light, three light rays from an object used to find the image location by, formed by a convex mirror? This also we did yesterday. It's the same three basic rules, except um, when the parallel light ray comes in, parallel to the optical axis, it's reflected away from the focal point, which as Kate said, is behind the mirror. When a line or when a ray is incident in such a way that it would pass through the focal point on the reverse other side of the mirror, it's reflected parallel to the optical axis. And the one that hits the mirror on the optical axis is reflected in the same manner as uh, with a concave mirror, but those of course diverge and they won't form a real image. How can, you use, how can you tell if the image formed is going to be real or virtual when we're talking about, oh, we haven't done the mirror equation yet. So we will talk about that. We'll come back to that. Um, but we, let's see. So we'll talk about this as well. Um, let's talk about Q and R after our um, examples or at least during. Okay, Oop, I still want it. Okay. So spherical mirror formula, uh, this is something that we would have found by doing lab C. Uh, you would have been able to see these relationships a little better. The book puts, uh, writes it out pretty well in this chapter. 
Um, but simply put, we can describe a spherical mirror and the image is formed by this reciprocal type formula. Where F will be the focal length of the mirror. DO is, we call it the object distance. So this is the distance between the object and, and mirror. And DI is the distance between the mirror and image. Let's see. And your, um, this is a real image when di is greater than zero and uh, it's a virtual image when the opposite is true. And then the focal length here is greater than zero um, for concave mirrors and less than zero for convex mirrors. And you can basically um, justify that by saying that when it's positive, it's in real space. And when it's negative, it's in virtual space. And that's where the negative comes from for that. We'll go through pretty quickly a couple of examples so that we can see how you apply this. And then the other thing that your book goes through is a derivation of, we can actually use similar information to figure out the magnification of an image when compared to an object, um, simply by saying that the um, height, so the magnification, I'll do it like this. which we usually abbreviate as a capital M, is normally going to be H naught or H O, the object height, divided by the image height times negative one. And um, this'll, this negative comes in because of an inversion. So if we get a negative number, it'll be inverted. The book goes through a derivation that shows how we can combine the uh, formula that we had up here with this to also show that you can find the same magnification by taking the object distance divided by the image distance. And I wanna make one check to make sure that I didn't spoof something up here. Yeah, that's all fine. I just thought there was a negative number in there for some reason. Set. Oh, yep. I beg your pardon. The negative comes in. If we were comparing these two, the negative would be there. But what I was forgetting is that the magnification is defined in this way, the Im object height over the image height. And then we can find that alternatively by taking negative one times the object distance by the image distance. So these two formulas together are going to tell us all we need to know about an image formed by a spherical mirror. So let's put this into some practice. Um, yesterday we talked about how we could do some ray tracing and figure out where an image is formed and its size and whether it's inverted or not. 
Um, but this time we're going to use uh, the formulas. So the top formula to figure out where an image is and the magnification formula to figure out how big it is. And we'll be able to tell whether it's inverted or not as well. So let's take this example. A seven centimeter tall leaf is placed 30 centimeters in front of an eight centimeter focal length concave mirror. So I'm gonna sketch that. Uh, let's do a straight line there. So here's my optical axis. I'll draw that first. I'm going to draw a mirror here. And for this, this can be a sketch. I don't have to be super careful as I would if I were ray tracing. And I'm going to put the focal length right there at eight centimeters. And my object is out here. And its distance, I'm going to label as the DO equals 30 centimeters. So that means that's the distance from here to the mirror. And the question is, where is the image formed? So what this is saying in this question is, what is DI? We don't care right now for the height, but I will mark that down, that it is seven centimeters tall. We'll use that for another part of this example. Okay, so the, the formula for any of these spherical mirrors goes back to the one over F is equal to one over D naught DO plus one over DI. And we wanna find DI. So I'm going to first get rid of the one over DO fraction. I can't just flip this, right? Because there are uh, two terms on the right-hand side. So you can't just flip everything. It will not work that way. Um, but I can subtract off the one over DO from both sides. So that one over DI on this side is equal to one over F minus one over DO. And I can put some values in for that. So one over F would be one over eight centimeters minus one over the object distance, one over 30 centimeters. And that's one equal to one over DI. I'm gonna work back up here so I don't squish everything. So that one over DI, I'm gonna put this in the calculator and I'm okay personally leaving this as a decimal as we go through. So if I take one divided by eight, minus one divided by 30, I get a decimal number of 0 0.09166 and so forth. And the units here, the centimeters are on the bottom. So I'd write that as centimeters to the negative one, meaning that it's one over this many centimeters or this number in one over centimeters. And then all I have to do is um, invert that. So I'll hit the X to the negative one button on my calculator and I get that DI. So flipping the left-hand side, I get D, the image distance is equal to 10.9. And then the centimeters flip to the negative one, flip back gives me that. So I ended up with a positive number here um, it's somewhere outside the focal length. So it'd be right about here. Little bit, certainly closer to the focal length than it is to the object itself. What can I say about this? Is this a real image or is it a virtual image? And how can I use this result to tell me? 
real because the um, image distance wasn't negative. Right. That image distance being positive, anything in the positive realm is saying that it is in the real area. Right. That's saying it's out somewhere in front of the mirror and, and we could put a, a screen there to capture it if we wanted. Oh, Mr. Sklenica, I think Maya might be in the waiting room. I don't think she is. I let her in, I noticed. Eventually, anyway. I have the advantage over you because I'm using my, my iPad for this so I can see what I write. So I have your pictures all over the screen. Whereas you probably can see maybe a strip of, of the rest of us. Okay, next, oh, and we answered number C, or letter C, because it's real, because DI is greater than DO. So let's go on to how large is the image. If we wanna figure out how large something is, we need to find the magnification. So magnification formula is negative DO over DI. We have both of those measurements already, so all we have to do, I beg your pardon, I pause please, I recognize it now, I goofed those up. It's upside down. So I'm going back up to this formula. Negative DI over DO. Apologies. So, but we can go back and use those two values, the DO that we started with, object distance, and the DI, the image distance that we just calculated, negative 10.8, sorry, nine centimeters for the image distance, and 30 centimeters for the object distance, and of course the negative doesn't go along with our image distance there, it's part of our formula. Mathematically it doesn't matter, but conceptually it might. So I'm gonna take my 10.9 centimeters divided by 30, and I get a, the uh, product is, our quotient, negative 0 0.363. Notice the centimeters cross out, so this is a magnification factor. It doesn't tell us directly how big it is. So to find the actual size, we take the original height, the 7.00 centimeters, and multiply it by that. And so we get a negative, huh, how about that? 2.54 centimeters. Okay, so that tells us the size. So is this larger or smaller than our original? Smaller. Smaller. Obvious, right? Because it started at seven centimeters and now it is 2.54 centimeters. This negative tells us something too. This tells it us that it is inverted, that it's flipped upside down. Uh, we know this because the magnification and the size is less than zero. So that's all the negative is telling us. And as it turns out, the numbers that I happen to choose means that the image is exactly one inch tall. How about that? Okay, we're gonna use, we're gonna take a look at the other, uh, another, another option here is to say, let's use the same setup, but instead of a concave mirror, 
let's put a convex mirror in there. Uh, before we go on, we've got five minutes, and like I said, I won't hold you here. I'll, it's recording, so if you need to bug out, that's okay. Um, but I am going to go through another example for anyone who's here and record it, and then post that together. Um, any questions on this problem, though? Um, Mr. Sklenka, mm -hmm. your um, the magnification formula um, in the book it has it as the initial height over the um, objects or the I, I goofed up both of them so if you look at the top of that page I started up there and forgot to correct it so yes so not only was I wrong on that part I, I flipped both of them right that's what you're saying right like so good thank you for pointing that out yep I, I started at the top of the page and then my memory kicked in midway, and that's why I thought to correct it. Uh, the calculation down here in part B, though, is, is okay. I had remembered by that point. Anything else? Okay, so our next question, the other one we're going to do today is similar setup, but now a convex mirror instead of a concave mirror, and we want to do, answer the same questions. Um, by the way, just as an update before people start leaving, uh, I did get confirmation. As far as I know, I only have, I don't have meetings at this time tomorrow, so I will just be hanging out on Zoom, and uh, if you want to join me and ask questions, you are welcome to do that during that time. Shoot. Okay, so I'm going to draw my convex mirror now. Now, the focal point is back here, and that focal point is eight centimeters. But my object, of course, is still in front of the mirror at 30 centimeters. And the question is still, where is the image formed, which says, what is di? So the formula we use is the same. 1 over f is equal to 1 over do plus 1 over di. We can use the same formula, but we do have to make a change because what this means is that our focal point is negative when we're marking it out like this. We'll go through the same steps otherwise, though. Uh, to find di, we have to subtract 1 over do from both sides. Now, when we put numbers in, though, we've got to be careful to say it's 1 over negative 8 centimeters minus 1 over 30 centimeters. And that changes things quite a bit. We get a total of 1 over di is equal to negative 0 0.158 centimeters to the, the negative 1. Or flipping that. negative 6.32 centimeters. So that means that the image will be on the, wrong, on the negative side, so the virtual side of the mirror, right about there. Not quite to where the focal point is behind it because it's a smaller number but it'll be there and that answers our question. It's a virtual image. And we can tell that because the image distance is less than zero. There's, we can't put a screen back there uh, to capture the light because the light isn't actually ever intersecting. 
We can use the same formula to find the image size though by first finding the magnification. Negative, I gotta make sure I get it right, di over do. Which means a negative and on top the image distance was six, negative 6.32 centimeters. The object distance as before was 30 centimeters. So combining these actually gets rid of that negative. Get a 0 0.211. The size then equals our original height, seven centimeters, times that magnification factor, 0 0.211. So it's 1.47 centimeters tall, quite short and virtual. Is it upright or is it, vert or is it upside down? Upright. How do you know? The magnification number or value is a positive number. Right. That negative in magnification just means it's either flipped if it's negative or upright if it's positive. Okay, and then so these this formula, the um, mirror formula up here, and the mag magnification formula work for any of these mirrors. We just have to uh, adjust it for whether it's a concave or a convex. It actually even does work for a plane mirror, but it's a little weird. In a plane mirror, anyone has, can anyone hazard a guess? What's different or what do we have to adjust for in a plane mirror? Notice that for a concave to convex, the only difference we had to make was that the focal length for a convex is negative. What would the focal length of a plane mirror be? Would it be zero? One because it's like not curved? You're both on the right track. Think, so the, um, the focal point from a spherical mirror is, as was pointed out earlier, half of the radius of curvature. If you've got a plane, where would the center of that circle be to cut that out of it? Infinitely far away, perchance? Right. It, it's almost like it's a piece of an infinitely large sphere. So the focal length is infinity. So here's where the zero comes in. If we put the mirror formula in there, that's zero. One over infinity equals zero. So that means, oops, that's a plus. So that means if I take one over, that one over DO is equal to negative one over DI. The object distance is the, as large as the image distance, but the image is on the, the negative side of the mirror, the virtual side, meaning that that image is going to be formed as far behind the mirror as you see as the object is in front of the mirror. The magnification, negative di over do. Well, di is equal to negative do, so we'd have a negative, negative DO over DI. Oop, other way around, sorry, DO. Which is one, magnification is one. It's not flipped upside down. So it does even extend into a plane mirror. We would just never actually make the calculation because we already knew that it was just as far behind the mirror as our object was in front and that it was the same size. But this sort of proves it out.
Okay, so now I can let you, I was only five, six minutes over. Um, any questions on the use of these two formulas that you'd like to ask? We're going to use them for the reading. Um, yes, so we kind of already answered the reading questions, I think. Um, when using a mirror equation, how can you tell if the image formed is real or virtual? Um, in a real image, di is greater than zero. In a virtual image, di is less than zero. We can tell if the uh, object, its, its magnification is, is negative six. So does that say it's bigger or smaller? And how do you know? Bigger. How do you know? Because that is what you multiply the object by. Right. And essentially the uh, absolute value is greater than one. If it was one, it'd be the same size. Less than one, it's going to be uh, smaller. Greater than one, it's going to be bigger. It's upright or inverted. I know it's inverted because m is less than zero. And um, we can tell that it is a real image in this case because m is equal to negative d i over d o for this to be negative six, d i must be greater than zero. So we can tell a lot just by the magnification. Okay, excellent. Thanks for your patience. Um, I will be on, I, th I think tomorrow at one and probably Monday at one. So as you're working on the homework, you can certainly pop in and ask any questions then. Of course, the solutions are up on Schoology as well. Um, so feel free to peruse them and shoot an email to me if you want. I see I've got a couple people who got their uh, readings in just in the nick of time. Um, so I'll score those. And for anyone else who is here, I'm just gonna put in that you've completed it, um, not necessarily on time, but um, that you completed it because of course, I imagine you will be updating any of those notes now. Okay, if there is nothing, if you want to talk, hang on the line. If, other, if not, then I will see you around. So um, I just had a question real quick. Uh-huh. So uh, I didn't bring my book to uh, oh, my little thing that I'm at right now. Uh, is there an online version of it? No, um, I okay. could for this part, um, because I am so very kind, I could uh, share or I could take some pictures for you. All right, yeah, if you could do that, that'd be great. So um, do you want for this reading as well as the next, all of them probably? um just to be safe I, I yeah just to be safe i'm i'm probably going back today or tomorrow okay so and it won't take much yeah. more effort to to snap a photo of all of them and then you can okay. zoom in and hopefully it'll turn out okay okay yeah if you could do that that'd be great you're well, yep okay okay so you're just gonna, you're just gonna email those to me then yep yep okay. in a few minutes you. you bet okay. you're welcome talk to you later yep have a great day thanks you too